right. Live on YouTube, yes, good. So, I'm very glad to, to present Professor Alan Manton, uh, who has been invited by um, Institute, Institute for Comparative Literature. And uh, well, uh, I will only um, say a few words so that you can you may uh, listen to 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 what it uh, matters so well professor alan mandan uh, uh, is quote <laughs> sufficiently old uh, to be an honorary researcher at the university of esther as declared by himself uh, though fabulously young to be attentive to and voracious about what it needs to be done in the conjunctural modern modernities. Uh, among uh, Wyndham Lewis, uh, innamorati and researchers is not only undoubtedly a reference, but also a superb support, always unconditionally helpful. Having completed a doctorate on Wyndham Lewis at Cambridge in 1976, he had, for example, already been teaching Shakespeare in Montreal in his springtimes. Since he has vortices blood in his veins, he is a privileged observer of interior migrations of those who embrace courage, wisdom, curiosity, and innovation, both in arts or literature and in most, uh, in the most minor details of common life. Talking about this brilliant work on literature and arts would be extremely unfair because I still am in a non-stop, in a non-stop process of discovery of it myself. In case you want to, please scrutinate to World Wide Web. Uh, there you may have a piece of luck and find out wonderful texts about a considerable variety of authors, topics, and utopias that Alan wrote. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to start now. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Alan. So the 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 the, the, the I, I beg your pardon. Yes, please. That's, <clears throat> yes, this is uh, what we're uh, talking about today. Break up as against control, and um, I'm trying to trace this concept of break up against control through from <clears throat> the beginning of the uh, 20th century uh, through to uh, the most recent um, uh, uh, writing in, in, in England. And I'm going through Wyndham Lewis, the artist um, and novelist and critic and who was born in 1882 and died in 1957, was one of the great modernists, belongs with Joyce Eliot Pound uh, in our understanding of modernism now. Then I move on to George Orwell briefly, because he is slightly different from, from what, um, what, what I'm uh, uh, setting up as my main theme, the breakup. And then I'm going to a, a novelist and writer called Will Self, who is writing at the moment in England and is extremely well known. And he, I'm putting forward to you as a potential area of interest. And then I'm ending um, uh, uh, in a slightly unusual way with a writer who is not known at all, uh, really outside a small area here in Plymouth where I live. And that's Steve Spence, who is nevertheless an excellent poet and will give an, a, a very good um, um, uh, instance of what I mean about breakup. 
So I'm, I'm, this discussion is, uh, I'm turning to my notes now, uh, this discussion um, can be uh, called an instant, uh, instance of cultural criticism. And I know that many of you are actively interested in this. As a student, I was fortunate enough to be at Birmingham University um, in the mid 1960s when this approach to culture was being developed by Richard Hoggart and most decisively by Stuart Hall, his colleague there. Since then, it has developed across Europe and into the United States and is recognized everywhere now as a valid and significant approach to the cultural world which we inhabit. Now, for those who may be less familiar with the idea of um, cultural studies historically, uh, it began in the late 1950s and in the 1960s as a literary investigation of uh, working class life and the way it was reflected in the press uh, and some novels of the time. Uh, in the following decades, uh, cultural studies expanded its interests radically and it became an interdisciplinary project engaging with all aspects of culture as it was actually lived. What were the meanings and values, and I quote, implicit and explicit in a particular way of life so that the entire culture and people's way of life was then part of the um, uh, part of what was explored. That's a quote from Raymond Williams, who was involved with this as well as Hall and Hoggart. Stuart Hall brought race and feminism into cultural studies and helped to theorize it so that the concept of the dialogic entered into it and the audience's active involvement became part of what was researched. So the dialogue becomes uh, a, a, a means of understanding um, the relationship between text and reality. And of course, politics entered into it all. Cultural studies um, and what was called the new left in the 1950s and 1960s uh, became inseparable. And to this day, cultural studies is a critique made from the left. It's not really easy to do it any other way. Um, alongside this came the recognition of what we now call mass culture. And that fired up the discussion into an engagement with television, popular music, youth culture, everything that uh, might be uh, considered relevant. It's all our lives in a sense. It became radically inclusive. Politically, there were new definitions. What now mattered was something called the post-industrial, which meant the power that corporations exercised through money or corporate capital. This alongside massive consumption by us, the masses. So. More recently, there has come a, uh, an even more serious realization that there has been a shift in the structure of economics. It is no longer states, countries, that control the economic situation, but the market, the international market, that is in control. The state is no longer wholly in control of what it can do. This has enormous implications that I don't want to pursue here, except to say that it will influence our consideration of any literary works that might be called universalist or world enclosing. George Orwell's 1984 is an obvious example. State interference with economics, particularly changes that are being made in Britain by a very conservative, conservative government that we have at the moment, they do affect literature and the arts. In the past, um, we've had a conservative government now for 13 years and everybody is uh, increasing, well, people are increasingly unhappy about it. In the past couple of days, I've come across two separate reports about, about how this affects the arts. The British withdrawal from the European Union, which we call Brexit, as I'm sure you know, 
um, has led to a breakdown in cultural relations with countries in Europe. In particular, musicians of all kinds, popular and classical, are finding it difficult to travel to concerts or gigs in Europe. In fact, someone who, who knows about this more intimately than I do told me um, a couple of hours ago that uh, bands, um, pop groups, um, or good bands uh, in, in Britain simply cannot afford to go into Europe. It has become an almost complete prevention of their movement. And obviously, um, since um, uh, they depend on uh, travel in, the, in, in, uh, in Europe for, for, for their survival, this is going to have a major impact on, on, um, on what's happening. It's a, it's a tragedy. Uh, it's our responsibility, of course, for having left Europe. But we have problems at home as well. There's a separate um, uh, point that I saw made this week. Um, the English lecturer Alex Nevin from Newcastle University has shown that the state's state benefit system, or the welfare state, as we call it, uh, which we use to, to support people who are unemployed or not yet employed or who are disabled and so on. It was a wonderful system that was set up after, after the Second World War. And uh, the welfare state is absolutely uh, uh, crucial for, 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 for millions of people. Well, what's happened um, uh, is that going on the dole uh, used to mean that you, you um, were free to occupy yourself as you wished if you weren't working. And it has been changed. That's been changed recently under the Tory government. And uh, from, the, um, from the 1950s and 60s onwards, um, the welfare state allowed uh, writers and actors and artists to learn their trades while they were young and when they were without um, a job. And they didn't have to uh, um, uh, uh, seek employment all the time. But what's, uh, uh, and, and, and what the Tories have changed that, and people now have to show that to get benefits, they must be trying all the time to get a job, and not getting a job is used against them. And to go to university, as you may know, has become enormously expensive here and the cost, the full cost, has to be paid back over decades uh, later, depending on what your income is. Um, creativity amongst the young has been hit by this, with the, with the result that the only successful artists we have now are, as the article I'm quoting puts it, those with access to private resources, money, education, contract, contacts, uh, unquote. Those are the only people who now are able to function as artists. The young, uh, young people, working class people, and people from minority ethnic backgrounds are having a particularly difficult time. Britain was good at art and literature for many decades after the Second World War but that is coming to an end, it seems. There is also in Britain at the moment a much wider pessimism. And you may have seen this reported over the, over the past years. We, we hear, for example, uh, we have, for example, a police force, especially in London, that appears corrupt and ineffective. We have low salaries, a shortage of housing, and the breakdown deliberately caused of our National Health Service, which was one of the great achievements of the post-war years. It's become difficult to go to a doctor and there are huge delays at our hospitals. This was a deliberate policy, the result of austerity brought in after the, uh, after the um, financial crisis of 2008. So what has happened there is that a failure of international finance has damaged our daily lives. So that's the context in which I want to uh, start um, to, to, to propose to you. 
uh, we're not a happy country, and I have a feeling that Portugal is um, uh, in a much better state than, than, than we are. Mm -hmm. I want to start now with Wyndham Lewis, who I'm, I'm one of the Wyndham Lewis scholars, I suppose. I wrote a PhD about him uh, many years ago. And um, uh, uh, Bruno, if you have the first um, picture of, um, of um, yes, thanks. This is Wyndham Lewis uh, in about 1913, 1914. Uh, he is overdressed deliberately, I think. The picture is not entirely uh, uh, serious, but, um, uh, and the cigarette is typical of the time. And the, in fact, Lewis was a bohemian. Uh, they were in bars and cafes around London. And he didn't really live like that, but I brought that picture just to show the kind of games playing <laughs> or self-representation that uh, people of, of that kind could go in for. Now, Lewis was a painter. He was a vorticist, a vorticist, as they called it. The vortex was the idea that London was tremendously exciting about art and, and painting and, uh, and the vortex, this great whirling um, uh, center would be, um, uh, would, would be this, uh, where they worked. They were influenced by um, the futurists, um, by Picasso and other great European painters, of course. Uh, they don't. They didn't incidentally share the uh, the uh, reactionary politics of the uh, futurists. I'm not to say that, but uh, Lewis was perfectly capable of not taking himself seriously, or at least he could turn satirically on himself. And so the next picture, if you would, um, the next image is Lewis's self-portrait on um, on. Um, uh, a few years later than this, in which he seems to have grown a great deal of, of, of teeth. Um, Bruno, if you would. No? Bruno? Next picture. Next picture, please. Vamos passar a ver. Uh, uh, we will um, see the next picture. Next picture soon. Yeah. And maybe Bruno, are you there? Well, nothing like uh, an alive <laughs> uh, Ruth Cost. Are you there, Bruno? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Can I help? You may please um, um, put the following um, uh, slide. Yes. There is a problem here, but I'll... Yeah. Now, this is... Thank you. And this is Lewis's later in the 1920s, uh, this is Lewis's version of himself. And quite apart from anything else, it's clearly satirical. He's turning on himself as um, a person um, <laughs> who is an artist, who is significant, who is also comic and the object of satire. And I shall return to this later in the, uh, in the discussion with, with, with somebody else who, who, who will also turn out to be satirized. All right, next, please. Now, Lewis started a magazine called Blast in 1914. Mm -hmm. It was only two numbers. It was quite famous. Uh, it was widely seen by um, people in, um, uh, in London at the time. And uh, it's uh, now regarded as a very important uh, early uh, breakthrough in, um, in uh, uh, art and literature, art and writing at the time. Next, please. Next, and now this is the second number, and you'll see a complete transformation here. Uh, what we've got is my first example of something being broken up. And uh, this is 1915, the First World War is, is, is going on. Lewis isn't yet in it, although he does become a gunner in it later. 
and you can see here that the guns and the people here are broken up. Uh, they're static and the city lies behind them. So we are living in the, the world of the, the urban world of, of the time, which was becoming uh, so much more significant than, than anything like the rural life or, or indeed the suburbs. So that's um, uh, Lewis's uh, reading of the war. And uh, I've got another, uh, another one now, next please. And this is called Workshop. Uh, the idea is, I think it's, it's where the artist works and the light is shining through the, uh, through the roof, uh, through the glass in the roof, and there are various windows and other structures around. And you can see again that what we have here is a breakup of, um, of uh, uh, the surroundings that, the, uh, that the, uh, the artist is in. And so you can infer uh, windows, walls, doors, and so on, but you're also close to something like abstraction. And that's about as far as Lewis went in that direction. Um, but we shall see now another example, please, next one. And this is, um, although it may not be apparent straight away, this is two people dancing. Um, the man is on the left, the woman is on the right, the woman's skirt is the uh, um, uh, curved part near the bottom of the uh, near the bottom of the painting. The skirt is uh, she's moving backwards, presumably, and the skirt is is folding up. The man is, has a triangular head. The woman has a complex uh, presence as well. And uh, uh, and <clears throat> I say behind, but of course, what has happened here is that the walls, the room the surroundings are on an equal level with, um, with uh, uh, the, the two figures. So uh, the perspective is destroyed, distance and placing is, is broken up, and there is a kind of presence and presentness throughout the whole thing. But yet again, um, the world is, um, is broken up again. Okay, next one please. Now, this is the, a key one for my discussion today. <clears throat> uh, this is called The Crowd, and it belongs to about 1914. It's probably, uh, Lewis travelled to Europe a lot, and it's, this is probably set in France. If you look in the very centre, you can see a red flag being held by uh, some of these outlined people. And at the bottom left, you can see the French flag flying. Now, what is happening here, apparently, is this, is that there is a crowd here which is moving across the painting from left to right and is heading up towards the circular objects, the three circular shapes you can see at the top right of the picture. So for the people on the move, there's stasis, and a holding of the work uh, in most of the left-hand part. In the top right, where they're going, something different is curvature, movement. And the idea is that what they're doing is they are attacking a factory. So that factory is, is making something, um, objects and so on, that are not humane, obviously. And the humane figures are rushing across the picture uh, in order to attack it. So what we have here is another attempt at breakup, because what is happening here is that ordinary people with their red flag are setting off across uh, the city as a crowd to engage with and break up the, um, the, um, uh, the factory, with it, which is inhumane. Uh, at the top right. This is a, a major painting of the time. It's, uh, I think it's in the Tate Gallery now, and it's, and it's possible to see it there, and it's very impressive. And uh, this is Lewis as a radical making an attack on what is controlled and shaped. Uh, at the bottom right, you can see the blocks and shapes. These are the shapes of control, and uh, those little rectangles there are 
images of control. Okay, so uh, this is um, this is uh, where we where we are uh, with with Lewis now. Um, now, uh, thank you. And to sit, to show um, how close uh, they are to what I'm talking about today. Uh, this is a page from Blast magazine that I showed you the cover of before. And uh, <laughs> the first page of, of what he's done virtually, Lewis has, has written all this, and he's blasting England. And uh, Blast first from politeness, England. Sorry, satirizing what we're supposed to be like. <clears throat> but um, what it is talking about is the weather, curse its climate, and the cloud sucks the town's heart, and a body of water, um, which is obviously the Atlantic Ocean, presses against us from the Floridas to make us mild, which is, is one of the things that happens, of course, is that we do have mild weather because of, because of the Atlantic. But what Lewis is talking about is so much vast machinery, that is nature itself, um, the climate, the sea, to produce. And this gets a bit difficult for us today, but as at, that, at the bottom right is a list of cultural um, uh, activities, uh, thank you, uh, cultural activities in Britain, which he is mocking and he's satirizing it and he's saying that um, the, the climate produces these uh, these things. The curate of Eltham, he was a well-known um, vicar. Uh, the Britannic esthete, so the cultural person who gets it wrong. The wild nature crank, crank obviously an early example of green people at work. Green domesticated policeman, London Coliseum socialist playwright. So Lewis has it in for everybody, really. Uh, musical comedy shows and chorus girls and an artist called uh, Tonks, who, 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 who we didn't like. So what we've got is cultural production here um, produced by um, the, uh, by the climate and by the uh, production of, um, uh, uh, of cultural products. So that's what Lewis is talking about. And this idea of cultural product, of course, is crucial to, to any discussion of in cultural studies. Uh, next one, please. And this one uh, is a bit further on in, and Lewis blasts the years 1837 to 1900. That's that Victorian period. Um, uh, queen Victoria uh, was was queen from 1837 to 1901, actually. And but notice that he's taking up an artist's position here. A curse, abysmal, inexcusable middle class, also aristocracy and proletariat. So he, he's 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 rejecting England, and he's rejecting the 19th century as a dominant cultural and political force. And so this is what um, he is <clears throat> doing. He's setting up a critique of what exists and is mocking it and, uh, and uh, uh, making it, obviously, from their point of view, these artists' point of view, unacceptable. I won't go into the rest of the page because some of it's a bit, <laughs> a bit um, <clears throat> complicated, but um, he, he obviously didn't like... Um, the thinking of Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, um, and its uh, liking for nature, then their liking for nature, because of course for him, what was really important was the urban urban world. And obviously there's a, a fraternizing of monkeys as a dig, a dig at, uh, at Darwinism and its, um, uh, and its effects. What the purgatory of Putney is, nobody quite knows. Uh, we tried to look it up, but no, nobody could quite find out. But um, Lewis's cultural um, range is is considerable. But this is about breaking up what existed and standing. So it, what I've 
said here is what stands in uh, as, as a prime example for um, what, what uh, I'm, I'm talking about today, the breakup of what was given. All right, um, the next one. Yeah, now I'm moving on to George Orwell and I'm, I'm not going to go on um, uh, about uh, to him quite as long as I uh, uh, have with Lewis, but Orwell, of course, is incredibly important novelist. Um, he lived from 1903 to 1950. He, was ill for much of his life from, uh, he, he died at 40, the age of 43, obviously, um, and he had lung, uh, lung problems. And um, uh, he used to go off to um, cold parts of Scotland, in fact, to write his novels, including 1984. And 1984 has had a tremendous influence, of course, um, on, on, uh, on all our thinking about where we stand politically at the moment. And uh, I, I don't want to, to, to go in, into it uh, too much, but um, it, it's perhaps worth reminding you of uh, all the uh, uh, concepts that Orwell brought in. And this, his, his, this novel is about control. Um, so is Animal Farm, incidentally, 1945. This is about control. Uh, Big Brother is the ultimate controlling force in, in, in the world of 1984, which is England. And a double think is, is, is uh, uh, an influential concept still used um, to, when people contradict themselves and consider two things in, the, in, in different ways in order to legitimize them. And um, there's the thought police, of course, to do with people who control thinking. And that's often used as a metaphor when writers want to discuss the ways in which, say, right-wing newspapers control what is said and thought. And there's newspeak as well, which is um, a, a brilliant concept con uh, about, um, about uh, finding a new language which will um, be used to dominate people. And the irony of the novel is that Winston Smith, um, who, who's the young, he's 34, I think he is in the novel, uh, the young um, writer and young personality who is, has to work at one of the ministries and he has to alter texts so that they say what the politicians, the controllers, um, Big Brother, want things to be said. So the past is constantly changed. Now, uh, uh, obviously that's a, a, a very potent metaphor for the way in which we interpret the past, our understanding of the past, and uh, which is why academic historians are so important to, to get it right. Now here, Winston Smith's in a bar, he's, Right at, this is right at the end of the novel. And he looks up at a portrait of Big Brother, the controller who is everywhere. And the party's ideological power is shown to succeed here. And at the same time, it's an individual who is suffering, the psychology of the individual, um, failure and defeat. So it's simple, but it's very effective and very meaningful. He gazed up at the enormous face. 40 years it had taken him to learn what kind of smile was hidden beneath that dark moustache, the dark moustache. Oh, cruel, needless misunderstanding. Oh, stubborn, self-willed exile from the loving breast. Two gin-scented tears trickled down the side of his nose. But it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. So what we have here is the defeat of Winston Smith, whom we've come to love and admire and then be puzzled by. What I'm su suggesting, so there's a psychology there, a psychology of individual mental, uh, moral and political defeat, as I say. Um, and this has been enormously influential and uh, uh, it remains so. And I, 
I hardly, you know, 1984 is one of the great works of the, of, of the last century, and it's and it remains crucially important now. One thing I want to say about it, though, was that um, uh, the world in which uh, I'm coming to the uh, to the wider world now, the world in which um, Winston Smith lives is that he lives in Oceania, which is England. England and uh, North and South America are Oceania in, in, in this novel. And Oceania is at war with um, uh, one of the other, uh, Eurasia, Eurasia. There's three areas that are in, in, in conflict with each other. And um, they're constant in the novel, there are constant statements by the people from, from above, the power people, constant um, um, assertions through the telescreen, as he calls it. So an early version of the television used as a propaganda machine is what um, Winston Smith is constantly watching. And that is, on Orwell's part, a brilliant piece of predictive um, imagery or presence. But um, what seemed to me, I, I'm only tentative about, about this thinking, but thinking about this in the last few days, I've just begun to wonder that Eurasia, uh, Oceania, and, um, uh, and, and East Asia are the three areas that are fighting each other in the, in the novel. What I want to suggest is, and it's not a criticism of Orwell, but what I want to suggest is that there is those three uh, areas as countries, um, uh, Eurasia runs, um, I read from Portugal in the, in the West, right across Europe and into uh, the Soviet, um, into uh, the USSR and right across, um, uh, right across the country there, a massive uh, country. And um, they fight each other. But what I wanted to suggest is that we now live in a world which is full of completeness, that although fighting takes place within these structures, obviously the Ukraine war is, or the attack on Ukraine is an example of that. Um, there is no, um, there's no war between um, settled groups as there was during the First and Second World War. Uh, things have changed and there is a completeness and inclusiveness about life in the world as a whole that is, um, transcends or alters the conception that Orwell has of three fighting areas. I just want to put that in as a, as a suggestion. I haven't developed it uh, properly, but it does seem to me possible to say that uh, for all the struggles that take place, uh, there, is, there is now a, a, a wholeness about the world um, that is uh, um, significant. And I'll return to this again slightly later uh, when we talk about the um, um, global village briefly. All right, uh, next one now. Now, uh, this is Will Self. Will Self is, as I say, uh, uh, is a, an important novelist that we have at the moment. He's also a journalist. And as you can see, he has a, uh, a, month, uh, a weekly column in uh, a rather good um, weekly journal called The, the New European. Um, and uh, he has this, this is the back page. And of course, here is Will Self uh, presented satirically um, as, as, uh, uh, as you see here. So he's perfectly happy with that, but it does go back to Lewis, uh, to Wyndham Lewis making a satirical portrait of himself as well. So there's two things going on there. And um, I took, to, to give you an example of what Will Self does, I've, uh, next one, please. Um, I've um, yeah, taken out, um, um, oh, oh, sorry, I haven't quite got there yet. Um, all right, here, I'll come to that in a minute. Here, here's, here's one of his novels, um, uh, excerpt from one of his novels. It's Shark, um, 
2014. And as you can see, the dots are his and the close up dots are mine. And Zach Bosner is a psychiatrist who, who's in several of Self's novel. Self is very much engaged with the real world, but he's also involved with the psychic condition of people within it. And so he turns inwards. Now, Lewis uh, spent a lot of time being external as a, as a writer and as an artist, as I pointed out. Um, Will Self, like James, and follows upon James Joyce and many others, of course, uh, in turning inwards and considering what the state of mind is of his characters. So um, uh, there's um, uh, a thing here then, um, uh, this is towards the end of the novel, and uh, Zach, um, we're, we're, they're at a meeting, they're at a party at a house, and they're leaving and uh, getting in, Zach's getting into the car. And he says, Zach would like to take Mark's hand, that's a young boy who's there, but that's out of the question, italics. He'd like to have this tangible confirmation he's the same man he was five years ago, 10, 20. Some people, Zach supposes, as they hunch up and walk through the drear back to the car, do indeed lead seamlessly integrated lives rather than experiencing a series of discrete and eminently forgettable episodes. Dot, dot, dot. But they're wrong too. Now what's happening here is that the, um, the upright type, the Roman type is um, more or less explicit um, considerations in Zach's mind. The italics are what he is thinking um, as he goes on and he thinks and here we go he rather than experience a series of discrete and eminently forgettable episodes but they're wrong to want seamlessly integrated lives so what i'm saying or suggesting here is that when zach thinks that it's wrong to have seamlessly integrated lives then will self is criticizing the whole business of integration, completeness, wholeness, right? So we have another example of breakup here. No, no, back please. Thanks. Um, and here, he, as I read on, he expands, self skillfully expands this. And he's thinking about the photographs of, of himself being taken. This is me lying down in the New Mexican desert. You can see the flash of the camera, only how surprised I am. And then suddenly, we're into something very serious. And this is Hiroshima, where we went for our holidays. Now, whether one does go to Hiroshima for holidays, I don't know. Anyway, apparently this is the case. And Zach is remembering this. And then, the meaning and memory of this comes upon him, of what happened at that most brutal time in 1945. The light of 10,000 suns has fixed, had fixed an image of unspeakable negativity on the collective consciousness forever. And so we never speak of it. We carry on regardless. We get our keys, we open the car door. And so what self has done is to skillfully put in one of the most damaging and dangerous and threatening events, the atomic bombing of parts of Japan, um, nuclear bombing of parts of Japan. And uh, uh, we have, despite what has happened, what happened back then in the war, we get our keys, we open the car door, we get in. Our son gets in and we say, did you enjoy the film? Stupid thing to say. And so the height of significance there comes back to the ordinariness of daily life. And uh, it's intended to make you think hard about what our lives mean. Uh, but again, the text here is broken up, as you can see, and the ideas, and it asserts the valueness 
value of um, discrete and discrete uh, episodes uh, as well. So breakup is approved here and is given in as, as, as evidence. All right, next one. Thanks. Now, um, Umbrella is uh, slightly earlier and equally good novel by self. I'm not going along here quickly, um, but uh, it, it, it refers, this is the opening page, uh, this is the opening paragraph. And the first thing he does is go in and quote, Eight Man by the Kinks from 1970. I'm an eight man, I'm an eight, eight man along. And then along comes Zachary, which is Zachary Busner, along from the Porter's Lodge where, uh, at the hospital where he's working. And uh, so um, let, me, let me just go on a few more and then I've got something for you. Um, and the window's cracked open so that Muswell Hill Calypso warms the cold free and barn at morning. We're in London, of course. The London, the, I'm, and I'm jumping on there. I'm an ape man, I'm an ape, ape man, or oh, I'm an ape man. The lawns and verges are soft with dew, his arms and legs are stiff. And, um, and, and then again, we're in a car, the Austrian steering wheel, plastic vertebrae, bent double, cathodic. Well, I'm an ape man is an extraordinary opening for a, um, uh, for, for a novel. And here is what is the kinks, ape man, Sounds like. Brenner? Bruno, <clears throat> please. <laughs> What's happening there is that um, uh, Ray Davis of the Kinks, who wrote that back in 1970, um, is uh, singing that he wants to be an ape man rather than a human being, because being a human being is to be controlling part of the system uh, and, uh, and so on. And some of the lines there, um, I, I quoted at the top there, but with overpopulation and inflation and starvation and the crazy politicians, I don't feel safe in this world no more. I want to say, sail away to a distant shore and make like an ape man. So he's, again, um, uh, satirizing himself. So this is the third example I've had today of a writer or singer or artist satirizing themselves, turning on themselves as a way of making a point, a wider point about how life, uh, life is worked and how the dissatisfactions are there. So satire turns upon the, uh, the people themselves. And um, so uh, I thought that you, you might be interested by that. Okay, um, thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, Will's also a, a journalist. Um, we were on friendly terms a few years ago. Um, and he's, he's, he's a liberal left journalist. And I'll just give you a quick um, uh, excerpt from, from his latest New European uh, 
um, uh, column, which was out last week, and he's talking about the Eurovision Song Contest, and he's satirizing that, but he's also satirizing the institutions of the European Union, of the EU here, because, uh, of course, as we all know, the EU is um, a very powerful, but it's also part of the corporate structure that I identified at the beginning. So the newspapers next day were full of how well the presenters had done and all the fearful tributes to brave, tearful tributes to brave Ukraine, obviously what was it? But it's that fabulous production of the event itself that has stayed with me, uh, self himself, like the migraine aura of our nauseating era. And here's part of that uh, brilliantly put uh, sense of pessimism and distress that we have in, in Britain at the moment. Because let's face it, Europhiles or not, we have to acknowledge that there's a democratic deficit of such depth in the EU's institutions that it's hard to uh, um, suspend disbelief in it. Whereas Eurovision, with its carefully weighted jury and popular votes, looks plausibly like an alternative governmental structure for our fissiparous yet broken up, that is, our fissiparous yet self-loving continent. So it's a, it's a very ingenious piece of, of, of satire in which the Eurovision is brought in satirically to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to satirize the European Union. And, it's, uh, and the democratic deficit that we have, but all across Europe in this case. And that Britain, obviously that uh, is a, 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 summarizes a theme that I've, uh, um, that I've been following through in, in this talk. So uh, Will Self's always worth reading, whether it's the novels or the journalism. Right, now I want to move on to a contemporary poet who, as I say in my notes, is a friend of mine here in Plymouth. He's not known, He's been, his books have been reviewed and I'm deliberately bringing in somebody who's not known, but he fits very well with my, with my uh, structure of my argument here. And uh, he, he, he is regarded, he reads widely across England and uh, uh, England and Britain and in different ways. What I'm going to do is, simply to read this poem and ask you to think about it rather than having me say things. But I'll say something at the end. But this is the best, one of the best instances of the broken up text that, that, I, that is a critique at the same time of where we're, and how we live. And this is, this is it. So this is, this is my friend Steve's poem. Notice there's a lot about pirates in it. No one can honestly predict what's going to happen during the next few weeks. Pirates tend to be creative types, brimming with ideas and ready to learn through trial and error. But I dislike intoxicating fluids. I prefer the bitter truth, said Alice, who just wanted to set all the mad people free. Will the pirates thrive or crumble as the global economy crashes all around us? Alice sat blowing perfect smoke rings, a skill she learned aboard the pirate ship. Nobody knew what changed the captain's mind, but he was a man of charm who talked well and fluently with imagination and humour. Bearded, muscular and prone to grunting, I think I like the sound of prehistoric pirates. Drink was mostly taken in moderation, yet the whole process seemed so mysterious that one hardly knew how to begin thinking about it. English pirates have a long history of relishing the rabbit. And in a sense, I'm going to leave you with that because um, I don't want to explain it. Um, I, the, the only thing that I would say is, of course, this breakup is deliberate. Uh, what Steve Spence does is he goes to existing texts and makes selections from them. And, um, uh, uh, these, these people who come in here, Alice in this one, for example, um, they're not real people, they're uh, fabrications, and they're given language which exists already in the culture. So the culture is brought into this poem, and uh, it's 
um, then left there, as it were, as a broken up structure of meaning and understanding. And um, if you can stand it, I'll go to the next poem, if you would, uh, Bruno. Thanks very much. And uh, because Steve C. Spence's poems are, are so entertaining in many ways, and this is a good place to end, and uh, I'll uh, come to conclusion after I've, uh, after I've um, read this one. As my sickness returned, I was absorbed by a gloomy black melancholy that nothing could dissipate. Yet Alice's spirits were high, and she bounded along with feelings of unbridled joy and hilarity. Is the credit crunch going to lead us deeper into the climate crunch? There are very few pirates who actually admit they enjoy writing, yet you have to be a consumer. If you don't buy lots of stuff, you're not a good citizen. Paranoia is far more common than had been expected and is also on the increase. The truth is, said Alice, you are rather difficult to fathom. Some pirates come for the cocktails, cuisine and designer chic. Yet he was a meat and two veg kind of guy who liked his gravy as thick as treacle. As a source of light, the mirror enjoys a special place in the room. Coming off the booze, he said, is like being jilted by the love of your life. And I shall leave that with you without any further commentary or explanation. And uh, with thanks to Steve Spence for his poems. Right. Do we want to move on to questions or anything like that? Well, um, no, uh, I think we are, um, uh, we have time to, 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 to listen to a few questions and, uh, or uh, read a few questions uh, um, or reflections or comments. Um, well, uh, about uh, about uh, what we have just heard. Um, anything in no doesn't mm, matter not yet but no, no, no. Uh, i hope uh well people are still you know you know digesting <laughs> helen yes. uh, yeah because um uh, anyway um the the combination uh you 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 have bought here is a rather uh, well uh, it's 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 uh, very very much um, um, intricate for some, but uh, yeah, I think you have uh, um, explained it so well that um, that. Um, uh, no, nothing more to say. <laughs> okay. Sorry. There's nothing more to say. You know, you know because you know, uh, um, uh, uh, in fact, it, it's it's uh, it's. Um, oh, a question is coming up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Elena Walsh asks, "What future do you foresee for the? What future do you foresee?" for the fissi perils, helplessness of the lower classes who are no longer children of the welfare state. What, what future do I see for the... Fissi perils. Uh, oh, fissi perils. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was very good. Yes, mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I'm not optimistic. I mean, I, I can't specify. It's a good question because it 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 hits exactly on everybody's concern who cares about these things, and of course it's people outside the system who care most deeply and most 
movingly about these things and write about them and make it possible. But of course, they're always a minority, and uh, they're, you know, as I'm, as I explained, increasingly excluded. Um, in Britain, of course, the possibility of a Labour government next year does give some hope for for people, and uh, every thoughtful person is is expecting that to happen. Um, the Labour Party leader um, Keir Starmer is is being very cautious about what he he says and and, and what he um, is is uh, pr promoting because he doesn't want to uh, appear to be. Uh, too far on the left, like Jeremy Corbyn was seen, seen to be. Um, Keir Starmer, in, in fact, uh, uh, was in Plymouth uh, uh, two, two or three weeks ago, and I went to listen to him, but it wasn't terribly exciting. And uh, uh, he's, uh, I think, avoiding excitement, avoiding excess, uh, in order to make sure that he, he, he gets selected. And uh, it's, it's, it could be close. Um, it might... Um, it might be better than that. Um, the Labour Party is well ahead now, and that's where the where the hope lies. Yeah. Yeah. Who else has got a question? I see. Yeah. Yes, there is. The, there is a, another question from uh, from uh, <clears throat> our colleague Pedro Eiras. Um, uh, I was very impacted by your considerations about Brexit right at the beginning, especially since at the Institute for Comparative Literature, we work on the concept of frontier. Of the frontier, yes. Yes, uh -huh. it's one of the main topics of our research. Yeah, right. in this context, our there any reasons to be cheerful? <laughs> <laughs> Another Thanks, song. Yes, thank you very much. Reason. And thank you, Eliana. Um, uh, I, I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, you, you will know more about the significance of the frontier than I do. But, uh, you know, this setting up of barriers at the behest of economic and political power on the right, uh, which is totally committed to the interests of the uh, of, 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 of the corporations is is not easy and um, uh, it's uh, you know we're suffering from from brexit and we know that um, we've we've chosen a frontier and people are slowly realizing that what our choice was was the wrong one and even one of the most right-wing people in this country Nigel Farage, a, a sort of politician who was responsible largely for promoting and the Brexit move um, has has himself admitted recently that uh, that it's uh, that it's a failure. Everybody else knows that as well, of course. Um, but we we've made ourselves uh, we've separated ourselves from the vitality of uh, of the European Union, despite its. Uh, despite its weaknesses. Well, Pedro Weiras uh, adds uh, uh, the, the following. My question is, what do you think we can do from a very concrete point of view to undo this border, allowing the communication of people, ideas and experiences? It's it's a peculiar paradox that are about the same time as that whole business of the um, the access of media to every part of the world gets stronger and stronger. Um, Marshall McLuhan came up with the idea of the global village, uh, which which he actually stole from Wyndham Lewis, uh, who 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 had it um, in um, uh, had the idea in 1948 uh, at a time when they were rethinking what had happened after the Second World War. Um, what um, 
uh, Lewis wrote uh, of 1948, now that the earth has become one big village with telephones laid on from one end, one end to the other and the ability to fly right across uh, the world come in. Um, I mean, the, it's a paradoxical situation in which we have extraordinary access to everywhere in the world with some exceptions, obviously, at the moment around Ukraine, and you can go there anyway. Um, and at the same time, the ideas or the political functions or the economic functions that I've been talking about have never been so powerful. So they have become internationalized at the same time as we also, who might object to it, also have internationalist possibilities, but it's not working out politically that way, whereas the internationalization of capital is, is extremely powerful. So uh, I, I, again, I don't have an answer. We, we, you know, there has to be some fundamental change and um, uh, what that could be, I don't know. I don't know, but obviously some kind of, I don't know, can one talk in terms of revolt, of refusal, of political change asserted somehow? I don't know, but uh, that, that, seems, that seems to be one, one set of possibilities. But we are in a weak position as against uh, uh, corporate life. Well, we have a, a question from Rui Mesquita. Rui Mesquita asks, I, uh, says, uh, I recall that in this essay about uh, good, bad books, Orwell complains that Wyndham Lewis is an extremely talented writer who mm. yet lacks literary Yes. Vitamins. Yes. Aren't we all suffering right now from this lack? <laughs> from this lack? Of vitamins, yeah. I, I suppose. Yes. Um, well, yeah, does this mean that the uh, that no writers are, are quite good enough? And uh, I, no, yes and no. I mean, I, I brought forward Will Self because he. Is, yeah, literary vitamins. Yeah, that's right. Really, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if that's what it is meant. I, I brought Will Self forward because he is a vital um, writer and a vital force culturally and uh, 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 at the moment in, in, in Britain. He's, what, 61, I think. He's well established. But I'm not making the claim that he's a great writer. He's a very good writer and he's a very significant writer for our times. But... I can't, in, uh, no, he's not James Joyce. And, uh, 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 it, 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 or Virginia Woolf, um, you know, and, and, and we don't have that power uh, at the moment. And that is part of what's running through everything I'm, I'm saying is that we are culturally, politically, we're in a weak position and it's, and it's, it's not working uh, from that point of view. Um, well. So, yeah, what was the question again? Uh, uh, personally, well, I, I may I say so. Uh, I, I'm well, I, okay. I'm going to make a a, a comment. Um, um, Lewis, uh, Lewis used to to say. I, I think it was in the the um, Caliph's design uh, in nineteen. Uh, uh, 18 uh, that uh, we cannot uh, we artists cannot afford to to uh, give up from uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing of course uh, to give up uh, the the odd circumstance circumstances because they fuel our uh, creativity so uh, there, there is so much to be done in art that uh, probably, uh, well, he's, he was very, very well, uh, he would be, unfortunately, he, he has been and he would be now very well uh, uh, regarding vitamins. <laughs> Don't you think so, uh, Roy Mosquita and Roy and... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, that was an important moment then, of course, it was 1918-19 when he wrote that. He fought during the, in the First World War. He, he knew, he'd seen death, obviously, uh, of that specialised kind. And he wanted the post-war years to be um, vital and transforming. And in many ways, the immediate post-war, post-war First World War was that. Uh, in 1922, we've also got the great year of Joyce's uh, um, Ulysses and of so much else. Uh, Lewis himself uh, was busy writing, although it didn't come through until uh, 1926 and then 1929 with his novels. He's a bit slow. But there, there, there was a, a strong sense then that uh, something vital needed to happen. Of course, it didn't. And um, uh, that generation rather lost um, lost track uh, in many ways. Obviously, Ezra Pound turned to the right. Lewis was on the right for, for several years, though he changed later. And they lost touch with people. And then, of course, the, 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 the interest then came in with W.H. Alden and Louis McNeese and various others coming in and uh, making a change and asserting um, in, in poetry and, and prose certain kinds of uh, um, sources of value and opposition, of course. Um, there's a terrible moment when we had the Spanish Civil War and that is lost in 1938-39. And uh, that was a major uh, defeat for the forces of, uh, of, of good. Um, and, and, and it's only when we get to the Second World War that uh, recovery begins. So, you know, yeah. that's all I can say about that. Yes. But, um, well, um, yeah. uh, there, there are more, more, uh, more questions. I, 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 I'm going to only to, to make a, oh, more, more, more. Well, uh, uh, only comments uh, for, uh, I would like to, to, to make about that. Uh, well, uh, with this this new uh, uh, panoply of <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but uh, of uh, 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 fashionable uh, and, 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 and and I'm glad they are uh, words uh, uh, and motos like sustainability and. Uh, uh, sustainability and uh, you know in, um, well uh, inclusion and so on and green green um, uh, travel green well green well of course of course this is this is a, a very a very interesting response to the market mm -hmm. uh, to what. Uh, uh, to what uh, uh, is going on, and maybe I don't know. Uh, picking up what you, you have said uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, the market is in the control, not governments. Yes, that's right. Not states. Maybe yeah. not state government. Uh, maybe starting from that. Yeah. Uh, if if the consume the consumers change, maybe something change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Y uh, yes, yeah. Um, I, I should say that when I made that remark about um, states losing control to the market, that I'm actually quoting two writers I'd found recently. Um, one's called William Davis, who writes for the uh, London Review of Books, which is a very authoritative um, journal. And, and so I felt quite sure about, uh, fairly confident about, about making that point. Um, obviously, I'm not, I'm not an economic specialist myself, and uh, so I had to rely on people of that of that kind. Um, but uh, yeah, but these these writers too are, are are themselves pessimistic about what might be achieved and what could be done and how it could be done. And it's this 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 breakdown of uh, of local resistance, um, you know, as against. Um, overwhelming uh, 
um, economic force that's that's making things so 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 difficult, um, and people don't seem to see a, a way forward. And uh, um, you know, as I say, the Labour Party maybe in this country, and I, I'm I'm right in thinking you have a broadly left uh, left coalition in Portugal, uh, which is. Uh, um, uh, it's far better than what, what we've had for the last 13 years anyway. And um, whatever <laughs> whatever uh, drawbacks you may feel it has, but um, you know, you're in a better position than we are. And um, you know, it, 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 it very much matters and uh, it's not clear what can be done. Well, uh, I have here two more questions. I don't um, know if I may. Uh, uh, a comment from uh, Paula Guimarães Pessoa. Uh, thank you, Paula. And uh, I thought it was stunning to see and understand those pieces of art from the beginning of the 20th century, full of meaning about social provoking ideas that are still very pertinent no nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that is a yes, they are pertinent. And, and thank you for that, because there is a continuity there, I think, whatever the disruptions and uh, and and changes and, 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 and so on, and especially in Lewis's, uh, Lewis's career, because he moved to the right and then he moved to the left again. And then he invented the global village. But uh, yes, you're right. And, and, and the ideas are always there. Yes. Political power is not. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. In this uh, country, well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in this country, universities are under attack now for, for, for being wide ranging and critical. It's, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. University, you meant. Yeah, universities are yes, under yes, attack. Yes, 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 I totally course. agree. Yes. yes. That's right. Yes. They'll attack, they'll attack yeah, yeah. universities if they possibly can. And mm -hmm. they grab their chances to do so. And they, they, they deplore people holding radical views or promoting, or as they see it, promoting um, the radical views. Of course, a responsible university academic will be presenting a point of view for consideration, not promoting it as a, as a, as a, as a uh, unassailable uh, objective. Um, so there's all that that's happening as well. Uh, yes, and uh, a last, a last uh, uh, comment and and, and question um, uh, from Vitor Matos. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, what what uh, is it that motivates you to research and 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 study this? Uh, these connections uh, and interconnections that uh, appear to be so divergent and uh, come uh, uh, come up uh, bring uh, come up uh, being so um, um, be, being so uh, profitable in this uh, wall in so this be, unity. Being so what? Being so what? And what? And become uh, well, they 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 appear to be so. Uh, well, afterwards, they oh. they 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 are. Um, they work beautifully in this uh, unit unity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I I I don't know. I don't know. I, I, you asked me to give give a talk, and so I I, I thought about things that have been concerning me for a long, well, for really for a long time. And uh, the, the, the question of, um, uh, of universalism, inclusiveness, uh, and, and so on had always been there. And they were strengthened by, um, by reading Lewis, they're present in Orwell, and, it's, uh, uh, and, and then Will Self um, seemed to be uh, another example of what, what, was, what was happening. I mean, there's, Plenty of you know a multitude of other things happening in the culture that, uh, that don't fit with this, of course. And um, you know, there's extremely good novels about details of life uh, that, that that don't generalize at all. And, uh, and there's no objection to those. But I try to make sense of matters that had interested me over a long period, 
because uh, I, I go back to the 60s and um, it did, you know, we got radicalized as students in the 60s and it, it stayed with me in my case and um, to, to a degree anyway. And um, it, 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 it's a question of making sense of, um, of the world <clears throat> based on your own experience and your own experience of what there is in the, in the world that, um, that has meaning for you. And this inclusiveness, um, and these possibilities, this worldwide possibilities, seem to me to be important at the moment. Well, well, this, everybody is saying, and some more kind words for you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you with smile, smile. Thank, uh, thank you so much. So people <laughs> are uh, uh, finishing with it. All so. Right. Well, uh, uh, Alan, yeah. I have to thank you once again and uh, again and again uh, for this wonderful uh, talk. And uh, well, uh, see you. Yes, <laughs> yes, see you soon. <laughs> see you soon. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much to everybody. And uh, well, I hope. We see each other soon. Okay. We can talk these things over again. Yes, that's right. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Yes.